Good morning and welcome Northsiders and friends to the worship of God on this 14th Sunday after Pentecost. This morning is Communion Sunday, so if you haven't gotten it already, I'd encourage you to find your elements in your home so that we might partake in the Lord's Supper together today. This morning we'll also continue in the Books We Miss sermon series with Ezra. And today we will sing the the hymn, He Keeps Me Singing, generated from the music survey um, as a suggestion from George Dale. If you've not filled out this survey and would like to, please contact myself or Director of Music, Tony Keeler. We learned this week that member and former Utopia resident Gerald Cook passed away on August the 29th. In lieu of sanctuary flowers customarily displayed upon the loss of the church member, the church donated in in his memory to his family's chosen nonprofit, the Wounded Warriors Project. On the first Sunday of November this year, we will call out his name, Gerald Cook, and say together, thanks be to God. There are a few other announcements I wanted to bring to your attention, and you might find even more announcements on the prayer sheet and weekly email, so please do stay connected. If you have ever been a lay reader before and would like to read in the future, please contact Worship Committee Chair Margaret Drummond. Please don't assume that we know that you are on the list, and this will help our um, committee members years and years to come so they know who to draw from and who has read recently. Don't forget to take advantage of the porch visits at the church as the cooler weather rolls in. Call the church and we'll have some chairs ready for you to meet with your church family. Last week, we had two groups take advantage of this ministry opportunity. As we enter into the holiday weekend, please remember that the virus is not slowing up. We have seen it touch the lives of so many, including members of our own church. So do your best to keep yourself safe and wear a mask to keep others around you safe. You. And as the psalmist says, O oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt God's name together.
Will you join me with the invocation? God, maker of heaven and earth, how glorious is your name in all the earth. Our Savior and our Lord, we call on you today. We pray for your Holy Spirit to join our hearts as one. And as we join with other believers in community, in worship, in prayers and praise to you, may we feel your presence this day. And please hear us now as we humbly join together and pray the prayer that you taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The psalm appointed for today, Psalm 118, 1 through 9. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. With the Lord on my side, I do not fear. What can mortals do to me? The Lord is on my side to help me. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in the mortals. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now join me as we have our confession of sin. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, 
and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from the past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed and grant to us to grow in more and more in your image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are a forgiven people. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. At this time, I'd like to welcome any children to participate in children's time at home. And as we do, I want to say a special happy birthday to two friends, to Owen Carner and Mary Patrick Carner. Happy birthday, Owen and Mary Patrick. Today's scripture, we're going to talk about rebuilding. And some of you at home might like to build things too. Maybe you like to build with Lego or with clay or with Minecraft. Building can be really fun, and sometimes we can do it spontaneously, and sometimes we like to have a plan. And so I brought some things to build today, and, you know, we keep these things in the fellowship hall, so when we have our church dinners together, we can build and create and have fun, sometimes when the grown-ups are doing boring things, but these things usually stay in there. And they're just nice bricks that are different colors. I have some red ones. And I'm just going to build this as long as I can. That's my plan. We'll see how it goes. See how far it can go. Well, let's try again. Almost all of them. Mm -hmm. Let's try from the bottom. Huh. Have you ever tried to build something and it just keeps breaking? Mm. It can be so frustrating when we build something and it falls and then we have to rebuild it again and then it falls and we have to rebuild it again or maybe our dog runs by and breaks it and then we have to rebuild it again and again and again. Can make me feel mad sometimes or frustrated or discouraged that maybe I shouldn't be building it in the first place. Well, all these things, I think, are some feelings that the people in the Bible story today felt too. Their temple had been destroyed and they knew that they needed to rebuild it. And so they started and then people were disappointed that it didn't look like how it did before. And so they kept building, and then neighbors got really frustrated that they were building something, so they stopped. And then there was different leaders, and they kept on trying over and over and over again, and it was frustrating, and it was sad, and it was discouraging, but they kept trying because they felt like it's what God wanted them to do, to have a place to worship God together because they'd been spread so, so far away. So the word that came to my mind this morning and thinking about how we rebuild things and how the Israelites rebuild things was persistence. Persistence. It means that we keep trying even when things don't go our way, even when things are difficult, even when we're discouraged. So today, as we listen to the scripture about rebuilding, I'd like for you to think of that word, persistence. And our prayer for this week is this. God, help me to keep trying even when it's tough to rebuild. Thanks, friends. You can go back with your families now.
The Witness of Scripture from Ezra 3, 1 through 13. When the seventh month came and the Israelites were in the towns, the people gathered together in Jerusalem. Then Yeshua, son of Yosadak, and his fellow priest, and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, with his kin, set out to build the altar of God of Israel, to offer burnt offerings on it, as prescribed in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set up the altar on its foundations because they were in dread of the neighboring peoples, and they offered burnt offerings upon it to the Lord morning and evening. And they kept the festival of booths as prescribed and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the ordinances as required for each day. And after that, the regular burnt offerings the offerings at the new moon, and at all the sacri- at, at, of the sacred festivals of the Lord, and the offerings of everyone who had made a freewill offering to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. So they gave money to the masons and the carpenters, and food and drink and oil to, to the Sidonians and the Tyrians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea, to Joppa, according to the grant that they had from King Cyrus of Persia. In the second year, after the arrival at the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Yeshua, son of Yosek, made the beginning together with the rest of their people, the priest and the Levites, and all who had come to Jerusalem from the capacity, captivity. They anointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to have oversight of the work on the house of the Lord. And Yeshua, with his sons and their kin, and Kadamil and his sons, who were descendants of Judah, along with the sons of Hinnadad and the Levites and their sons and kin, together took charge of the workers in the house of God. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments were stationed to praise the Lord with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals according to the directions of King David of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever towards Israel. And all the people responded with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many priests and Levites and heads of families, old people who had seen the first house on its foundations, wept with a loud voice when they saw this house, though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. 
for the people shouted so loudly that the sound was heard far away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As an avid Miami Dolphins fan, the phrase rebuilding year is very familiar to me. You see, it feels like the Dolphins have been rebuilding since Marino retired and I became a Dolphins fan the year after Marino retired. Every year is a rebuilding year. We get good young men drafted and then we don't have the skill set to let them learn and sit on the bench while veterans play. They are thrust into the fire and before you know it, that star defensive end has torn his ACL or the rookie cord- quarterback with a bright future has been sacked 52 times in the course of a season and that's not an exaggeration. Then without a doubt in two years we hear that same phrase again. Well, it's a rebuilding year. The book of Ezra is all about rebuilding. And in the Hebrew Bible, it is actually one unit with Nehemiah. They are supposed to be read together. Put simplistically, after the exile to Babylon, the Persian emperor, King Cyrus, allows some Jews to go back home and practice their religion. Ezra is in charge of building the temple, and Nehemiah is in charge with building the wall. All the while, both are extremely concerned with not repeating the mistakes of the past, and therefore, they promote strict adherence to the Torah, even if that, even if that involves excluding others. This morning, as we dive into the book of Ezra, I want us to consider the question, how do we rebuild? How do we rebuild? First, to rebuild we must admit that something is broken. The returned people in the story of Ezra had no doubt about that. The temple was gone. But they could have had thoughts of, well, we don't need a temple anymore. They could have said, well, there's nothing here and we're getting along just fine. We don't need a place to worship together. I can do my own spiritual thing on my own. But what they found was quite the opposite. They desired to have a place where they could come together to worship. And not only that, but the people who lived in the area before the return, either folks native to the land or people who were not exiled, wanted to worship Yahweh together too. This happens in chapter 4. It is problematic, however, that the leadership turns them down and says, no, you cannot worship with us. Let's think about this in our own context. There are some people who are concerned that when we return to in-person worship, some of our members and guests won't come back to worship with our church. And that might be so. And we will grieve them not returning. But I do know this, that even before the pandemic of COVID-19, there was an epidemic of isolation and loneliness taking over our neighborhood and our world, creeping in silently into the homes of those we love. And I know this because people of vastly different generations came and talked to me about it. And I know it because I feel it too. Maybe we have moved here, leaving what we knew behind, including family and friendship support. Or maybe we've lived here for a long time and our family and friends have moved on to other places But beyond anecdotal evidence, there is also some data to back it up. One of our denominational partners, the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, conducted an international discovery process about the urgent needs and powerful gifts within the CBF. 
And I served on the team that scoured through the data, including thousands of survey results and hours of listening sessions. And out of all of that work, one of the most powerful gifts of congregations was listed as deep, loving, interpersonal relationships. While one of the most urgent needs of our communities was connection. That is what is broken and needs to be rebuilt in the life of our little corner of the world. What's broken is the connection between deep, interpersonal, loving relationships within the church and the need for connection outside of the church. And we see this in the scripture too, right? It was more than the temple being rebuilt that was broken, wasn't it? It was those who rebuilt the temple not seeing the deep longing the needs in the neighborhood around them to be connected through the worship of God. In order to rebuild, we need to recognize that something is broken. And second, to be rebuild, we must start where we are and worship. In our scripture selection today from verse 1, it says that people were in their own towns, and when they came together, they did, and they celebrated festivals. And it seems like our own context a little bit, doesn't it? We are in our own individual homes, and we come together to worship on Sundays in spirit, if not in body. But look what it says in Ezra 3.6. It says, but the foundation of the temple was not yet laid. The foundation of the temple was not yet laid. Y'all, they were out there offering sacrifices to God before the foundation was even poured. Better yet, before the masons and the carpenters were sent out to get the material, Not having a built place of worship did not prevent them from worshiping where they were. I love a plan, and I love having everything in place before acting. But what I hear this scripture saying to me is, Courtney, don't wait for the staging area to be set. Don't wait until things are how you want it. Begin the rebuilding process now through worship. And our church has done that so beautifully. And I believe we must continue to worship even as things are unsettled, even as we desire to be in a centralized place. Rebuilding starts where we are today, and it begins with worship. Third, to rebuild, we need young and we need old. Look to verse 8 in chapter 3. They appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to have oversight of the work of the house of the Lord. When it came to rebuilding the temple, the more seasoned members let the younger ones have oversight over the project. That is, they let the younger people have a say in the plans. I know I've referenced the book Growing Young before, but what image, one image from the book that continues to stick with me reminds me of this instance. The authors say that for churches to grow young, They need to practice handing over the keys to young people, physically handing over keys to the church. That means not simply giving someone a task to do, but entrusting them with the responsibility and authority to do it. It's giving someone the keys to the building and trusting them with them, rather than opening up the door and telling them what to do and how to do it your way. So all is going well at this point in Ezra. They've laid the foundation. They bring out the worship leaders. They sing a song that everyone knows. But then something happens in verse 12. It reads, But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the families, old people who had seen the first house on its foundation, wept with a loud voice when they saw this house, though many shouted for joy. Remember, in step three, to rebuild, we need young and old It looks like the young people took initiative and built a solid and beautiful foundation with all of the best intentions, I am sure. But it seems like that what they did not do was listen to the stories and wisdom of the elders, the ones who had seen the temple when it stood first. The church must use the blessing of its intergenerational nature if we are to rebuild Fourth, to rebuild, we must do so with joy and sorrow. And this comes from verse 13. The people could not distinguish the sound of joyful shout from the sound of people's weeping. 
for the people shouted so loudly that the sound was heard from far away. The mingling cries of shouts for joy and wails were indistinguishable from one another. Even if the young and the old had worked together in perfect harmony, there still would have been some grief. Each change we experience, each transition we have, even if they're good ones, they cause grief. When we say hello to something new, it means that we say goodbye to something that once was. Before I came to Northside, one perhaps unusual thing that encouraged me that Northside was a place who took itself seriously when rebuilding for God's purposes. It was the closing of the after-school program. It's easy to start something, but it's very, very hard to end it, especially at churches. Churches have a tendency to add on program after program, ministry after ministry, without taking anything away or asking God, what doors have you opened and which ones have you closed? It's even more difficult to choose to end something and offer thanks for it and ask God what's next. The closing of the after-school program at Northside was a painful time and a difficult decision, even with the assurance that the need was being met elsewhere in the community and it was financially draining the church. And no matter how many things we do in that building now, there will perhaps always be grief at saying goodbye to the after-school program. I don't know what God might be asking us to start or what God might be asking us to end as we rebuild now, but I do know that we'll have shouts of joy and wails of grief. It won't be all one thing or another. So now that we know how to rebuild... We might ask, why do we need to rebuild in the first place? As much as I joke about the dolphins always being in a rebuilding year, I think that we forget that that could be the mindset of the church too, that the church is always rebuilding. I fear that we've been so tied to the church as an institution that we forget that. And unfortunately, if the church does not rebuild itself over and over again, it dies. A way that might be able to help us think about this is the institutional life of the church. Think about a bell curve. At the base of the bell curve is a dream, and this is what begins a church, a dream of what God is calling us to do and be here and now. It's exciting. It's energizing. And as we move up to the peak of that bell curve, The church develops beliefs and goals and structures, and in its maturity, it's operating with ministry. Now, on the other end of that bell curve is the decline towards death, and that decline begins with nostalgia and questioning, polarization, and finally dropout. Now, how do we avoid the tipping point on this bell curve? How do we regenerate life in the church again? At the peak of our ministry, when the organization is mature and thriving or things are as good as they can get, that's the moment when we ask a very important set of questions and it takes us back to that beginning again. We ask, is our original dream still a valid dream, still the dream that God has given us? Do we have unified beliefs? Do we share common goals? Do we need to change our structure? Each of these things is a rebuilding question. They make us go back to the foundation we have laid and ask God what to do. God, what dream shall we dream? This week, Betty Byrne shared with me some stories about a pastor she knew in Memphis after his recent retirement in 2019, who died tragically in a bicycle accident earlier this year. Reverend Steve Montgomery pastored Idlewild Presbyterian Church since 2000, a church with a Gothic stone bell tower standing 120 feet tall with 48 bronze bells. It's quite an impressive structure. It's quite a thing to build. In his tribute in the online paper, Daily Memphian, George Calkins quoted Montgomery's idea of the church as following. Montgomery said this, 
The church is God and love and doing things for folks, like teaching children, hugging older folks, walking with people through the valley of the shadow of death, loving the sometimes unlovable, listening, really listening to the pain of those hurt by the church, preparing meals for the sick, praying together, working for justice, planting a garden, and building a church that is just as generous as God's grace. Building a church that is just as generous as God's grace. And you know, I bet that Idlewild is still doing church that way too, even after Steve's retirement and death, because it sounds like under the leadership of this humble pastor, they understood what it was like to ask the questions about beliefs and dreams and goals and structures. It sounds like they stood at the foundation of their church and asked God what to build over and over and over again, knowing that each time it might cause joy and sorrow. But each time the foundation of the church was sure and the intentions were good. Dang it. Let's go back to thinking about Idlewild. And I bet that they are still doing church that way too, even after Steve's retirement and death, because it sounds like under the leadership of this humble pastor, they understood what it was like to ask questions about dreams and beliefs and goals and structures. It sounds like they stood at the foundation of their church and asked God what to build and rebuild over and over and over again, knowing that each time it might cause joy and sorrow, but each time the foundation was sure and the intentions were good because the God that they and the God that we worship is sure and good. And I'll leave us with three questions that I'd like for us to consider for Northside as we think about this time in biblical history contemporary history, and the history of our church. And it comes from CBF's Dawning's Visioning's Retreat. And at the end of this retreat, they ask participants three questions. 20 years from now, what do you hope people are most saying about this time period? Let's ask our church three questions. 20 years from now, what do you hope people are saying most about this time period of our church? Number two, 20 years from now, what are the three most important characteristics of our church during this chapter? And 20 years from now, what are the three things that our church will be known for in the community? So what do you say? Shall we rebuild together over and over and over again. And may it be so in our lives. Amen. at the table for everyone born clean water and bread a shelter a space a safe place for growing for everyone born a star overhead and God will delight when and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice. Justice and joy. For young and for old, a place at the table, a voice to be heard, a part in the song the hands of a child and hands of the wrinkled 
for young and for old, the right to belong. And God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice. Justice and joy. We come now to this table, knowing that this table is not Northside's table, it is God's table. And God's table is strong enough to carry any of your burdens. And God's table is wide enough to welcome everyone born. And God's table is level enough to give us a foretaste of the justice in the coming kingdom of God. And so, we give you thanks that on the night of his arrest, Jesus took the bread and having given thanks to you, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread is eaten in unison. In the same way, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the covenant in my blood, shed for you and for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. The cup is taken in unison. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory.
Please join me in offering prayer. God, we give you this offering and pray that you would use it to provide for the poor, to comfort the mourners, to minister to the meek, to feed the hungry, and to provide mercy and peace for those who are persecuted. Help us to serve these whom you have blessed, for you have loved us, and in your grace, have given us more than we need. Amen. my prayer is that you have found worship meaningful today in the sharing of scripture and song and in the Lord's Supper. And so as you go this week, you, will you receive this benediction? Know that you have been welcomed here not in spite of who you are, but precisely because of who you are, a beloved child of God. And as you go, stand at the foundation and ask God, what would you have us rebuild. And let us ask it over and over and over again. Go in peace to love and serve our God. Amen. <laughs>